thanks for the questions, guys and girls. Um, I think, look, the way we want to structure this is to be fairly informal as well. It doesn't have to just be me talking the entire time because I know you probably get sick of that. Um, and uh, some of this stuff might be repetition for you all. Uh, and so I don't want to be going over things that are unnecessary. But I guess part of the point of the repetition is because that's probably what this dials down to as much as anything. And what all of you are saying is that it's in order to dial in your race nutrition, you really need to dial it in when you're training. And that's probably the crux of any of, of this entire conversation. And it's something that I know Elizabeth and I and Jonathan keep reiterating with you all is that you need to be practicing what you want to do on race day in training. And that that's really the, you know, you can see that's the premise of the entire program that we put towards you. Well, not the entire program, but certainly right, um, when we talk about the race fueling. So I think there's a few elements to how to dial in your race fueling. And probably uh, Elizabeth will talk about the practical elements of it. But even from a practical standpoint, I think the first and foremost uh, important thing to dial in your race nutrition is to find the products that actually you can tolerate and you actually like. And it, it sounds silly, but it's amazing how many people don't actually think about what sort of uh, flavors that they're going to be uh, consuming on race day and trialing different products in order to actually uh, find which products suit you best. So I think from uh, from a flavor perspective, it's it's probably a very important thing to get that nailed down. And then it comes down to products. And I think products is something I've talked about and obviously we highlight in uh, PDFs uh, and in the app of certain products that we recommend. Now, I'm constantly learning about new products. New products are constantly coming on the market and um, athletes are constantly asking me about products. And I know Elizabeth's going to talk a little bit about some of the electrolytes that you could choose to use in relation to uh, on the race and especially the run where people are having problems with salt tabs. Um, sorry. Uh, and so I think... In terms of products, we talk about if we're talking about race fueling, then we're going to talk about oxidation rates of carbohydrates. And so a lot of the research when we look at oxidation rates um, have been done on cyclists. And the majority of this will show that uh, they're very similar in terms of gels and blocks um, and liquid, to be fair the oxidation rates are fairly similar. Bars are a little bit different and they're certainly slower. Um, in terms of oxidation rates, it goes gels, blocks, fluids, uh, bars. But to be honest, the blocks and the, the gels and the fluids probably don't change that much. So that's an important part to think about. If, if you are racing fast, you certainly want to be choosing gels, blocks, fluids over bars. <laughs> What it then comes down to when you look at those studies and they're looking at oxidation rates, they also look at uh, the perception of the athlete and how easy it was to consume those products. And that's where it starts to get a little bit interesting because obviously gels and blocks um, and fluids, their gels and fluids are going to be easier than blocks to consume. So then you've got that element of how you want to think about what products I'm taking in. And then you throw on that the next step, which is really the gastric emptying and how those products will sit in the gut. And again, on a bike, and we talk about this a lot, on a bike, it's not going to matter how they're sitting in your gut, really, because there's no bouncing around. And this is something where I think a lot of athletes, especially triathletes, when they first come into the program, they have tended to use things like um, a scratch labs. Tailwind seems to be a very popular one. Uh, I think there's another one called Endurance. And these high carbohydrate um, solutions and also Gatorade, I guess, is another one that some people will consume. And I'm sure you've all listened to um, and read multiple stories about a certain uh, pro athlete recently who tried to consume, eight, I think it was 18 or 24 Gatorades in a race and wondered why he had issues when he got to the run. <laughs> but another story. I don't know who was advising him. Um, those products will sit in the gut. So a hypertonic solution, i.e. one which contains a lot of carbohydrates and the osmolarity is right up, 
that's going to sit in the gut and it's not going to leave the gut because the concentration in the gut is going to be much higher than outside. So it starts to pull water in. When you're consuming fluids, it's going to pull more and more fluid into the gut to try and dilute that down. Now, when you're eating gels, blocks and liquids, it's all still going into the same place. Um, and what's, what's probably pretty poorly understood, and I think I, I certainly am trying to still understand it, and I think everyone is, is when you consume the gels, they don't go into a separate little pocket in your stomach and then you, you, know, you have the water and it goes somewhere else and it keeps it nice and diluted. It all goes in the same place. But it's probably something to do with the oxidation rate and then how the fluid is coming in and diluting in that at that point and allowing it to go into that uh, that in lower intestine uh, or the upper upper intestine, I guess, if you want to call it that, um, and and then dispersing and being able to the blood glucose that being able to cross over the barrier and get into the blood. So what you've then got to think about is okay if i am not just on a bike and i am going to have to transition into something where there's going to be a lot of mechanical stress i.e the diaphragm bouncing up and down you don't probably you probably don't want to have a lot of liquid in the gut so this then starts to make you think okay well if i know the oxidation rates are all fairly similar with gels and blocks being better than <clears throat> the most um in terms of ease of consumption, gels and blocks and liquids are probably about the same. But then in terms of how they sit in the gut and the gastric emptying rates, you're probably going to go towards gels and blocks. You start to see that potentially gels and blocks are going to be a better way of fueling in a race and certainly for shorter races. I think there could be an argument for utilising a carbohydrate liquid in an Ironman, um, certainly in the first half of the bike and finishing that amount of carbohydrates uh, in liquid form uh, in the first part of the bike. It certainly depends on the athlete and how you respond to that. It's certainly open to it. I think it's a discussion um, with Elizabeth or myself about that and, and practicing that. Uh, so I think that's a very important part of it. Um, the other thing about carbohydrates in liquid form that needs to be considered is if it's a really cold race and you're not drinking a lot, suddenly you're not getting the carbs in as well. And that's another factor to consider. Certainly, if it's a very hot race, you're probably going to be drinking more. But then if it's a very hot race, you often have difficulties processing the carbohydrates anyway, which then leads to all that uh, high uh, hypertonic solution sitting in the gut and causing issues as well. So you sort of if it's not, if you're drinking carbs in my book. Um, and so... I think in terms of carbohydrates, really what you want to be thinking about is using blocks uh, and gels on the bike. And then as you transition into the run, <clears throat> certainly for a 70 Olympic 70.3, and I would probably argue an Ironman, you probably want to be just using gels. Um, I think for the Ironman you distance, you certainly can look at using uh, some form of bar just purely for calories. And I think that has to be practiced fairly well. Um, I know some athletes will make their own sort of uh, bars and things like that, especially the pros like Sarah will have made something to actually chew on that she feels very comfortable with. Um, it's a lot of effort for a lot of people. So I think finding a bar that you feel comfortable on that makes sense. So if we go back to the bike, so if we're thinking gels and blocks, um, for women and men, it's going to be different. And this is probably because you are going to be slightly smaller if you're a female than a male athlete. Now, I know that's a generalisation. There are some very small men out there and there are some very big women out there. So we can't just say that, but I'm going to generalise. Um, so for women, you're probably going to be looking at eating roughly every 20 to 30 minutes. Now, there's obviously a 10-minute gap there and you need to work on what you can cope with. It's going to come down to what you can cope with. Now, if you're taking in, let's say, um, the average gel will have 25 grams in it, okay? So if you manage to have a feed at 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, you're at 75 grams of carbs. Like That's going to be a lot for a lot of women. Um, and that... That's great, but I think 
all too often when I'm looking at the data that you're all pulling through, it is amazing to see so many women only consuming sort of 30 to 40 grams of carbs per hour. And I, I can't emphasize it enough. The women really need to work on this. And, you know, I know Julia's on there and, um, you know, Julia worked really, really hard at improving that. And she, she had gut issues and uh, in the past and, you know, she's up. What are you at now, Julia, 75? Yeah, pretty much, um, especially yeah, with fun. racing, yeah. Yeah, racing, and um, I mean, I'm happy to do it, pump her tires, but Julia won her race, uh, the last one she did, and uh, with no issues, and uh, yeah. <laughs> which, which race was it again? Just to remind everyone. Uh, Des Moines, Ironman. Des Moines. 70.3, yeah, Des Moines. Yeah, and you know, it, it was really pleasing to see her having practiced, gone from like 20 grams of carbs per hour on the bike and the run to now consuming sort of, you know, definitely 75 plus um consistently and that's been something that she's really worked on in training and the only reason she could manage that in the race is because she knew she could cope with it in training and mm -hmm. it you know to julia, julia will you know attest it, it wasn't like she did it once and it was like oh great i can consume 75 grams no it was like january february march <laughs> exactly yeah, it, was, it was a couple months of working on it and even though it took three months or, or so to get to that point, she now still practices that at set times in her training. So it's not every week and it's definitely not every session, but when she's got those, you know, Z3 sessions and she, she knows, okay, I can practice that feeling. And not just from the perspective of getting the carbs in and practicing, okay, I can get 75 grams. It now comes down to the practicality of it, of how to actually consume that. And then we've got Elliot on the call as well. Now, Elliot, he loves Ultraman, but he's obviously doing Ironman as well. And, you know, again, to his, when he started, his, his carbohydrate consumption was not that great. Um, and his hydration strategy, and we'll talk about his hydration strategy, but, um, you know, he's now at 120 to, what, 140 grams, Elliot? Uh, about that, 120, certainly, 120? Certainly. I can certainly handle bike? over, yes. I mean, I can handle that much without any difficulty. Other than yeah. when I hit about five hours, if I'm going that long, then I kind of just don't want to eat anything more. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, speaking of the heat at Coeur d'Alene, which of course was extreme, um, I really hit that last hour or so on the bike. I just needed cold water with nothing in it because it was just too much. But so that, that was fine, but yeah. Uh, but that's sort just, of at the outer extremes. And it was quarter alone was, you know, extremely hot. I think, I think the dropout rate in that race was what 35% and the average in it was, nine man is 6%. So it gives you an indicator. The fact that Elliot was, he was a little bit bummed with his time in the end because it probably wasn't exactly what he wanted. But then when I think he reflected back on, uh, the dropout rates, it was a fantastic race. So, Well, it was a terrible race for everybody. So yeah. um, I think the air temperature was 105 and they reported the, the pavement temperature in the 130s. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was hot. <laughs> Very hot. So can you touch on, touch on let, let's talk about, like obviously we, we can talk about the science as much as anything, but this is more about the practical side. And we talked about like, choice of you know flavors are important the choice of product is important how do you actually manage it on the bike let's talk about the bike because eh? you're you obviously consumed a lot how do you structure it uh in terms of just carrying even and, and this may cross a little bit into yours elizabeth so feel free to jump in as well oh okay so i'm on the spot um, yeah, yeah i mean look well, uh, it's, I think it's, it's so important to understand how to carry this and manage it like yeah it's a lot. I mean, I never ate that much uh, before on the bike. I was doing a lot of calories. I was doing just gels and a lot of calories in the drink. So um, what it meant was my I couldn't wear really a tri-top because the pockets aren't big enough. So something to think about because um, I'm literally carrying. I think I carried enough for because we were eating every 15 minutes so it was alternating blocks picky bars and gels 
was using EFS, so the flasks. And, you know, basically the, my, you know, they're in T1 after I get out of the swim. All goes into my, into my back pockets. Um, and every 15 minutes, I'm just grabbing from one pocket or another. So it's, um, it's not bad in the sense it kind of keeps you in the race. Um, as Scott knows, I've been experimenting with, and I was just doing pH hydration in the drink, right? So no cal- basically no calories in the drink. And I had a tube of tablets in my bento box. Um, where I'm experimenting right now with a little bit more calories in the drink. And uh, so maybe eating every 20 minutes instead of every 15, which doesn't sound like much, but if you only have to do it three times in an hour versus four times in an hour, it's just one less thing and you can carry less. But the other thing you've got to do is then you've, you ha- actually have to use, um, you know, on an Ironman, you have to use uh, special needs bags. Because if you're carrying four hours worth, well, I'm not riding four hours. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, we kind of, so then you stop and you restock and go, which doesn't take that long, but, um, and it's probably not bad to stop. But um, I, have described it as I'm basically, if you're going out for that ride, I'm going out for a meal where I I happen to be riding. I mean, it feels like that. It's, it's a lot. Um, but it it wasn't a problem. I mean, I was fine. I got off that bike and I didn't have any GI issues. That was not the issue. (laughs) I mean, I didn't have it. I didn't have anything like that. It was just, it was, it was, it was the living dead on that run. I mean, it's a, it's a three loop run with not a lot of shade. And I'd say 90, 90% of the people were walking from the start. So, um, uh, so in terms of, in terms of where you've got the, you, you mentioned you've got everything in your back pockets and that, do you organize yourself? I know a couple of others use bento boxes and they, they use that on their bike. Um, to store a lot of the the products as well you tend not to do that it's just not big enough i mean i i kept the tube of ph hydration in the bento box so that when i was refilling with water from the aid station i pop a couple of tablets in um, which is the other thing we were experimenting with as to whether i should do more or less or um but uh you know theoretically you can do that but I'm just carrying too much. I mean, I just, the bento box is just not big enough to carry that much stuff. Um, yeah. At and least I, think, I found it. And I think that that's an important point. And that's probably, you know, for Elliot, it, it also comes down to the products he's actually choosing. So he mentioned EFS, which is a large flask and contains a hundred mm-hmm. grams, uh, which, you know, for um, for most people, uh, you know, you could have one of those per hour and that's going to be providing 100 grams. I know Julia uses that as well. Um, and it is a product, but unfortunately it's been discontinued. Uh, so yes. that, is, that is something to think about. You do, probably don't want to start practicing with a product that's going to be discontinued. Um, the precision hydration gels, which have been brought out, which I know quite a few of you have trialed, um i've tried them i think elizabeth's been trying them jonathan uh, julia and so on they're 30 grams a pop so that also means you could have one of those every 20 minutes and that would you know get you over 90 grams per hour which is again as elliot said only three times in an hour you're having to reach for something i think that's a very um it's, it's a sound choice they sit well they have very minimal uh flavor the consistency is a little thick and the uh the tear off is quite hard at this point in time apparently they are changing their product uh their packaging because i think it's just too hard to rip off on the run um i'm certainly not running at a pace that anyone of you would be proud of but i find it difficult even at that so um, I think that's, and it's good feedback to give to companies like that. The other product would be something like Endurance Tap, which I've talked to a lot of athletes about because of uh, the viscosity of it. Um, it being very liquid, it's fantastic on the run to get it down. 
Not so good necessarily on the bike though, because you've got to unscrew the lid and the liquid can go everywhere. So it's little practical elements like that that you've got to consider. And that's where things like the blocks are probably a little bit easier to manage. Um, I know a lot of the athletes I recommend is to cut um, the packets in half so that you've got three at a go and you want to have those three blocks every, you know, again, every 15 to 20 minutes as you're eating that. And so it's, it's little practical things like that that I think are going to make a big difference to how you're doing that and you need to be practising those little things as you go. Um, what else? So stop, why don't you transition over to Elizabeth? Yeah. Go yeah, let's go other, into those practical bits. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing that I always work with my athletes on is I see them like they'll they'll practice their fueling, but they don't practice it whilst riding or running. Like they'll pull over on their bike and like open up the package and start eating from the bar or, you know, and just which it's like, oh, we're stopping. I'll stop and fuel. It's been whatever. And it's like, you're not doing that in a race and you're not, you know, this isn't a picnic. Like you have to be able to eat whilst whilst going. So I think the most practical thing is, is like, like Scott said, cut the gel packs in half. I always like open up your picky bar, bar wrappers or whatever bar you choose and cut those in half or in fourths. So they're in bite size pieces. Um, if uh, you're like gels, I think, um, you know, for women, th those are, you're right, uh, the tiniest pockets on those triathlon kits. It's like, you can't fit anything in those things. So it stuffed in sports bras is because it's real easy to just like reach out and, you know, grab those. And it's like, okay, I've got four in here. I've got, you know, two back here. And you kind of have to know, I, I joke that it's like, you're like, you know, one of those old like gunslingers, like you have to know what's in your pockets and where everything is and that you've practiced that before. Um, I have so, I've seen athletes where they're, they want to make their own, products, which is great. Like, you know, the feed zone portables or whatever. Um, and those are all fine and dandy or, you know, whatever random things they want to eat. And it's totally different than what they're going to be having out there. They're not taking them, um, out there or they've, you know, always made them in nice little, you know, nice little packets. And it's, and on race day, that's different after it gets hot. So it's like, if you're using these things and they're going to be your strategy, again, you can use the feed zone portables or whatever on, on a lot of your training rides, but you have to get in there and go through the steps, every single one that you're going to be doing. Um, I have my athletes set timers because sometimes they'll get in the zone and whether that's, you know, every 15 minutes, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So your watch goes off. And it's like clockwork that you are just consuming. You know exactly what it is that you have to consume. Um, and then I think it's good to have that backup plan. If, you know, how many athletes have like biked over train tracks or cracks in the road and they lose their, the problem with liquid stuff is that, you know, their bottle falls out and then there goes, you know, 400 calories. And what are, you know, when are they going to find time to make that up? So just as important as it is to practice the steps that you have, what is your plan B and how are you going to, if something goes wrong, if you drop a gel packet, um, because you're an arrow and you know, you just couldn't get it torn open. What's the backup. So having those components, I think a part of it are really important. Um, and then knowing how Scott said, like knowing what you like to eat. I see so many athletes pick things because either they see the pros advertising them and they think, okay, this is the one that I have to do. And the funny thing is, I mean, in some cases, the pros actually do like them, but a lot of times that's who's paying the bill and they might have other options that they're using. So just because you see someone using something or promoting something that doesn't mean that they're consuming it. So it that doesn't have to be the Bible for you. Find things that you enjoy eating. And especially for an Ironman race that you are going to enjoy eating for a very long period of time. And that's the only thing that you're going to be eating. You know, I see athletes will stop, you know, on their like hundred mile training rides and get chips and something. I mean, I've done it. It's I'm not pointing the finger. And <laughs> those are, those are a nice break from all the sweet stuff. 
But on race day, if you're not going to be stopping and grabbing a bag of chips, then you have to figure out, can you have 14 gels or however many, you know, in a row? And are you going to be able to consume those and still like them? I think there's, the gels are great. There's alternative things that you can use. I've, um, those honey sticks that you like, you know, you get at farmer's markets or whatever. They're just little containers of honey. Um, those can work in a pinch if you happen to like the flavor of honey. Um, here we have, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's really good Taco Bell hot sauce. Uh, it's super high in salt and sodium and they're in these little packets and you can just go in and add, I mean, I've been on long rides and like gone through the drive through and got some because it, you need something salty sometimes after all those sweet stuff. So I know I have a couple of those in my pocket, like find something that you're going to like and it doesn't have to be the, you know, $6 a pack Martin gel with, you know, the hydro bubbles that you know, you don't think they're magical bubbles. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, making it doable, making it practical and, you know, finding what works for you on all of those training rides in terms of fueling is really important. And then having that backup plan. And if you get to that point and knowing, okay, I can't, I, I don't want this stuff. Knowing what's on the course is a big deal. Also knowing what you're going to, and even if you don't like, like I am not a fan of all of the stuff that Iron Man supplies, but you're, I will have absolutely done a few rides where I know and use some of those products. So at least even if I don't like them, I know if I can tolerate them or not and how they're going to work for me. Um, and in terms of gels, I know we we're talking about them. Spring is another energy gel that we have pretty common here that I think is great. Um, even like those packaged baby foods. I mean, you can get some of those little packages that you'll find out are like, you know, 60 to 80 grams of carbohydrates in there. And they taste like plums or they taste like peas or they're, you know, sweet potato or whatever. And they're way cheaper. <laughs> you can get like five for two bucks um, and they're really easy to open. And so, you know, going some of those routes also to get a lot of carbohydrates in is another another option. The, you mentioned the spring gels and um, also the baby food. I think it is something that comes up a lot. Um, my concern with that is that they contain a lot of fructose and um, the spring gels, especially because they are made a lot from fruit. Uh, and I'd like to know if anyone has had them. I, I've had a few athletes who have used spring and also some of the baby food and they tend to end up with GI distress. And I think it is related to the high fructose content in there, which I know it, um, you know, when we talk about multi types of tra um, transporter carbohydrates, you'll, you'll read about it in articles and that you need fructose and glucose. It's really only if you're getting into the high amounts of carbohydrate consumption. And even then, I think it's um, <laughs> it's probably a little bit overplayed and you're probably going to get some fructose anywhere from other, like within the gels and that. You don't need to go out of your way to find fructose. Um, has anyone had those spring gels? and what are your thoughts on them? Do you, or other baby food sort of sources, things like that? Have you tried sweet potato sort of puree um, as an alternative to the sweetness? Has anyone done that? No, don't tend to. I, I've tried uh, some of them. Some of the spring gels, the ones that have more of the coconut oil and fat, so it's a little higher fat to carbohydrate ratio. I like I like those. I think they're really palatable to me. Um, but I have a, like, I don't like the super sweet stuff. Like the Martin gels are just too, too sweet tasting. Um, and I've tried different packages of baby food, but I can't consume them all at once. Like I'll have one over the course of like an hour or so. So a little bit at a time, um, yeah. mixed with whole foods. So that's probably why I don't have the like rush of fructose. Um, yeah. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah, I want to make sure we uh, leave some time for Q and A. So there, there was a few questions that came in, but we'll first prioritize anyone that's live here on the call. Is there any questions um, anyone has on the call? If not, I'm happy to run through the list of questions we received. 
I'm, I'm curious about uh, two quick things, I hope, uh, quick. One, uh, has anybody either used or talked to athletes about using UCAN? Because at least a lot of my like friends are now like using it a lot and talking it up. And I haven't tried it yet, but I just wondered if like that's on other people's radar or if that just happens to be like my, my community of people. I can give my experience on it. Palatinos is um, used by UCAN. Palatinos is a uh, it's a slow um, slow digesting carbohydrate, and it's based around uh, like sustained energy and also a low GI. So what it doesn't do is result in a blood sugar rise, um, which is pretty interesting if you're trying to go pretty fast. Uh, if you if you're not going fast and you're doing ultras and you're you're sort of plodding along, I think it could be fantastic. And I say this is because we created um, a product at True, which is their fuel, which uses uh, Palatinos. I think it's a really interesting product. It can slow down gastric emptying. If you look at the studies in Palatinos, gastric emptying rates aren't as good as other types of carbohydrates. So. I think, Cameron, it can be really good for long rides that you're not necessarily practicing nutrition for and just getting some miles under the belt. Um, I think for running, um, they do UCAN gels as well. Is that right? Yeah, they, it's a new product, yeah. Oh, they do, and that's got Platinos in it as well? Yeah, I think it could be really good for ultras. Um, because of that Palatinos and the slow release carbohydrates. Um, I think if it's for 70.3 or if you're really trying to crush an event, you, you'd certainly want to practice it and know that you can cope with it and that it benefits you, that you feel good on it as opposed to just eating stuff and it not necessarily increasing blood sugars and um, helping performance. I don't know, Elizabeth, have you had experience on that? I, both with athletes and myself, I've tried it. Uh, I would say one, it is the powder is an acquired taste. So you really like, you either love it or hate it. Um, it's very hard to mix. Like you have to pour a little bit at a time, shake it a little bit at a time. And if it is a long, hot day or race by the end, it's just, it's kind of clumped and it's not. So like if it's your first bottle, Potentially, there's there. I kind of like it, uh, but if it's your fourth bottle, it's hot. And <laughs> yuck. Um, Got it. Okay. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and just it, I've used it years ago when I was doing more ultra runs, and it, I'm agreeing with both of you. I found that it just didn't give me enough energy if I was trying to go faster and I found it was the mixing was, yeah, yeah I'd, la I'd have like half at the end of a, an hour, I'd have like half of the bottom, you know, the bottom of the bottle would be filled with a bunch of powder. Yep. Yeah. So that, Cam, and, and that goes to Elizabeth's point. I think there's a lot of athletes out there promoting products <laughs> that they don't use. And I can tell you that having worked in a lot of pro teams, they might be wearing Nike shoes, but they certainly aren't sponsored. Oh, they're sponsored by, sorry, they'll be wearing a Nike branded shoe, but they're not sponsored by them sort of thing. Like, you know, uh, or it's not really that type of shoe or it's not really that type of equipment, things like that. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. I can tell you now that the All Blacks are sponsored by a big nutrition company. They do not use that product. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, they, they use another product, uh, but it's it's what the, you know, it's money talks a lot. And someone someone pulled someone up on uh, Instagram, I think, the other day with the pro athlete that was promoting a product that was completely shit. And, uh, you know, I was like, why are you promoting this? Like, it's not fair to the millions or hundreds of thousands of people who follow you. Like, you know, you don't use it. So just be very careful on that. Like, don't believe the hype behind a lot of the marketing stuff what i'd say like certainly try things find out what is useful for you um and then stick to it and obviously ask questions about is it actually a good product like you did then i think you can is a is great product for certain people um i just don't know if it's very good for uh 
70.3 and Ironman potentially and certainly Olympic and trying to go really fast. Yeah. Got and it. All right. Perfect. Two people sure. credit, which they might not be on the call. So maybe some of your friends or people that are using it, if they are in that like 16, a 17 almost hour mark and they're going at that slower pace and they're like, I just need to get through this. And, you know, I'm going to be out there for that long period of time it could possibly work for them and they might like it. And again, if you like the flavoring, some people really do think that it's beneficial. So, um, you know, yeah, I, and I think I certainly took to heart, you know, Scott's comment around like a longer train. Cause that's like a lot of these guys are just going on like a long four five, six hour cycling ride. That's not racing. It's just like, I, I like that sort of sustained energy platform. Yeah. So I just wanted to understand, and, and so that was really helpful to think about it in more of that respect, not in the, the racing fuel category. Right. Cool, thanks. Um, and while we're on it, before we get to the next question, I meant to say, as you're thinking about trying out products, um, and I have no affiliation with them whatsoever, there's a company called The Feed, and they sell like single bars and single gels and single, like, so you can get single servings of things and, you know, instead of having to buy a box or whatever, and it's a really handy way to try out all different kinds of, of products. Um, I know the ones that like Scott and I specifically talk about and love, I, I would say I'm, you know, almost ridiculously devoted to, <laughs> but it's important to, you know, find if you don't like those flavors or they don't happen to work for you, finding something that does. And that's kind of, it's, you know, T-H-E-F-E-E-D, uh, and- we'll, we'll send out the link, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I actually, I, I use them for that exact same reason as well. Um, and they also have some of the other products like the probiotics and stuff that you guys have been recommending. So um, actually, while I'm on that topic, uh, sorry, quick question, like um, for using things like in my race, like I had practiced with and used the SOS like hydration, like the little packets. And then I realized during the race, I was like, oh crap, because every single time I tried to like rip off the top, it like wouldn't come out because like my bat, like it was in my pocket, which was so sweaty. And it was like, it, it wouldn't empty out of the like little packet. And so I was like literally like tearing it with my teeth, like trying to like take it in. So would you recommend having like instead put it in like one of those little like I know base performance has like the things that they use for salt, but like put it in a plastic container so that you can empty it easier? Uh, there's two parts you could handle this is firstly, I think your bottle setup, and we haven't even talked about that and we'll probably keep that at another. We'll do that yeah. next week. Yeah. But <laughs> the bottle the bottle setup. So like how many bottles are you using? Like if it's 70.3 and if you know what your sweat rate is, you know, do you have your central tube and then two bottles on the back? That's, you know, that's what, 700 mil, three. You grab an extra bottle of water because you've two of those are electrolytes. One's water. You finish the water. You grab another water. That's four bottles. That's 2.8 liters. If you're finishing the bike in two and a half hours, depending on your sweat rate, that should be heaps. So actually the electrolyte could be made up in your two bottles on the bike one bottle of water, get rid of the bottle of water, grab the other. Like you're not having to worry about mixing stuff. 70.3, certainly manageable. You've got a special need station for the Ironman. You could just go in, grab the other bottles, bang, you're back on, you're ready to go. You're not worrying about playing with electrolytes on the bike. If you did need extra electrolytes, that then could be something like salt tabs um, or you mentioned the base performance, the salt lick. I know some people have the canister on their bike handles even where they shake it and put it on their thumb lick, that sort of stuff. But salt caps might be an easier way of managing on the bike if you run out of electrolyte. So we can certainly, I think we have that call, probably the next one. We talk about hydration strategies because again, there's so much to that as well. Like, you know, I know I've picked on Elliot today, but talking about if you're a super sweater, you know, talking about products like glycerol, uh, which used to be banned by WADA and, you know, Elliot's played around with glycerol to hyperhydrate. If you're a super sweater, it, it could be something to talk about. Um, Alejandro as well, he's a, he's a super sweater is what I would classify him as. And then if you throw on top that what your sodium concentration is, 
And I know I've tried to get a lot of you to get tested with um, precision hydration to find out what your sodium concentration is in your sweat. And that's probably leading into other things. But um, yeah, I think the hydration management, it's a whole nother thing on top of uh, sort of your, your energy management. So, but it, it's certainly a good question, Ken. Sorry, Elizabeth, you had you were going to answer something about there as well um, about um, the electrolytes and just how exactly, to manage it. Exactly the same thing. Like if you stock your bottles, like you can almost, if you know you're going to have st like a strict water bottle and can replace that, then you can put enough in the other bottles, um, you know, to, to like hyper make them, you know, instead of four scoops, it's six scoops of SOS, knowing that it's concentrated and you're mixing it with water. Um, and, you, and you just have a sip of that and then yeah. sip your water afterwards, things like that. And also practicing that if you are going to use a, a slightly more concentrated version of something like SOS or um, Noon or what else is there at the moment, um, the Precision, whatever it is, you, you just practice that and get used to that. And that extra salt in there, it's often quite nice, I think, for a lot of you, especially if you're consuming a lot of sweet products. So you just balance it off against each other. Great. We're up on our time here. Do you, Elizabeth and Scott, do you, are you free to stay on for another minute? I've, or actually, two? I've actually got a call with Anne. So I'm going to okay. jump off, but I'm going to leave Elizabeth to uh, handle everything. And uh, right. I, just, I just wanted to say to everyone, like, it, it's, so, uh, it's so great seeing the progress that all of you have made in terms of, you know, not just carbohydrate consumption rates, but I think understanding the science behind that is really refreshing. And then also from a hydration standpoint, everyone making the progress of like, okay, I get it. I'm sweating this much. I need to consume this much. Oh, okay. I have this amount of electrolytes. I need that. And just seeing the progress in like, you know, when you're writing down the sweat tests and the carbohydrate testing, it's so refreshing to see like the progress that everyone's making and the reported like subjectiveness of like, how you're feeling better or how your your energy rates uh, uh, your energy is feeling better and then to see race results where you know so many athletes are hitting pbs and prs or winning races it's um it's really great to see so uh kudos to you all um it, it's great so thanks scott um but i'll uh, i'll chat to you guys next week hopefully we'll have another one thanks a lot all right bye elizabeth do you have a few more minutes to Absolutely. just cover Two yep. final questions. Okay, we'll make this sort of a lightning round, so then we can wrap it up here. But but I wanted to make sure to address you know the, the questions that came in. So first one is, what's the best way to carry salt tabs on the run? I have a tough time getting them out of my race belt and then out of their blister package. So I know this one. This question's from Danny. I actually spoke with her earlier this week, and she said while she was in her race, she took out her blister pack and then I think was trying to get it out you know, and then actually dropped it and then picked it up on her next round on yeah. the run. So wow. That's impressive. yeah, would love to, uh, if you have any tips on that. Sure. Uh, I would say like put th things in your own packaging, whether that's a Ziploc baggie that, you know, is easy to, you know, they make those little snack size ones. So they're tiny, easy to uh, open and close and shove in any random pocket. I think that's would be my most simple solution. Take them out of like the pre done packets. Uh, Scott mentioned those little pill boxes. That's a great way to keep them dry. If you have a bent, like a bento box that you can set in front of your bike um, and grab, uh, you know, take any, <laughs> leave the packaging behind and put it in your own, whether that's, you know, food can be in foil or, you know, saran wrap or whatever is easy, but the pills to keep track of them. Um, and they're tiny. I will always pack or have like, whether it's in special needs, the, or even just in one of my three, whatever Jersey pockets, an extra bag baggie of salt stuff. Um, because you will, they will get wet. You will drop them. Um, but I, so if you're doing the pills now, I love like, the base, the canister um, that he, so it's for, for those that haven't used it. Um, it's, it looks, I mean, it's like, sorry, I'm, I have no idea how big that is. <laughs> it's a couple inches, maybe. I don't know the size of like your like finger basically. 
and the salt is in there and all you have to do is lick your finger, open it up and it like sticks and attack there. Thank you. Perfect. I should have brought props. That is with a hand reference. That's excellent, Cameron. Thank you. Um, and would you like to demonstrate exactly the uh, tilting motion? <laughs> so you flip the top. There you go. Like lick your thumb, flip the top, and, it, and then you can just lick it straight off your thumb. Um, and I, Matt Miller from Base is a good friend of mine, but he knows like I love my SOS. So I have used his canister and poured it out and put my SOS in it. Or, you know, I've used his, so you can use, I mean, buy, buy his product. And then the second round after you've used the salts, keep the canister um, and fill it with whatever it is that you like. Uh, I think that especially on the run, because I don't like to be fidgeting with stuff uh, to have that to like dump is a really, um, yeah, a nice like equivalent um to be able to do and then you can just grab water from the aid stations as you go awesome and that will go for caffeine as well like in terms of storing caffeine pills oh yeah definitely yep yeah w one interesting thing danny said it was one of her tricks is she will like in the endurance tap uh packets the gel packet she'll like crush up one of the pills to put it in one of the packets that she knows she'll gonna have later on oh, as like a little smart. hack. So one thing for folks to consider she was gonna share, but she didn't make it to the call. So yeah, I share on her behalf. Clever. Look at look, we're like little what is that? Um break we're like breaking bad triathletes here. <laughs> in our own yeah. like rug mixes. This is a this is fantastic. Right. So the last question to close us out here, you know, I think this is an important one, is all around how do you problem solve when your plan goes bad? So when you start feeling sick and nauseated on the Ironman run, uh, the person who submitted this question, I'm not sure who, just said they've heard a lot of different strategies, like either eat or don't eat, drink water, don't drink water. I know uh, some coaches said drink Coke. So any tips on kind of how to work through that would be appreciated sure. it's the it's like the goal like the goldilocks symptom like just a little just not right this is too soft it's like there's a thousand different ways to solve that problem and as much as i you know scott and i are always preaching like practicing your your race nutrition and things beforehand hopefully and it sounds backwards but hopefully you have tried and incurred like consumed so many carbohydrates uh, that you've reached your limit and you know what, like you've had an experience where you've eaten too much and you have an upset stomach or you've eaten the wrong things because that information tells us, you know, kind of where your limit is and it gives you a better idea of how to manage that. So ride goals would be to at least once eat and consume maybe a little bit more than you needed. So you know what happens to your body. Like some people feel nauseous. Some people get like gas and bloating. Some people uh, can eat too much and then they just feel lethargic. So it's important to know, first of all, what your personal uh, GI issues are. And that's why trying different products to know too, like what works and doesn't work with your stomach. But if you get to that point where, um, and I think there's probably a different solution for different things. If you're at the point where your stomach is bloated and gassy, that's where those like antacids and tums come it come in handy. Uh, having those in your special needs bag or in a pack in the back um, to help kind of calm uh, a somewhat angry stomach. Um, if you're, I would say like a last resort that I know has worked for me and some of my athletes is activated charcoal uh, tablets or pills, um, which Hopefully none of you have experienced this. If you drink too much alcohol and you go into the emergency room and they pump some charcoal into your stomach, college graduation, it's rough, uh, but it, you know, eliminates the, it sucks in the toxins and the toxic liquid and helps you kind of digest that. They make these nice, friendly little activated charcoal pills uh, you can get at any health food store. Um, and so I would say as a last resort, having those just to help calm your stomach, they're not as fast acting as the Tums. Uh, those can help. Some people have found that digestive enzymes, again, test all of this out beforehand, not a race day. Uh, 
but as as you all know, when you're exercising, your digestion becomes less of a priority. It's about fueling your muscles, fueling your brain. And so digestion slows, especially in the heat. So digestive enzymes can help uh, your body process some of those some of those foods and maybe resolve some of those issues. Or if you know that in the in hot conditions you get GI issues, preempting that and taking some digestive enzymes uh, before you start can really help. If you're on the nausea side, like you just feel like I can't eat anymore, I feel like I'm gonna be sick. Uh, you know, God bless those women that um, have gone, you know, been pregnant and found out that ginger is excellent. Uh, so they sell them any like health section They're They call them pregnancy chews or ginger chews. You can get them anywhere. A lot of them have sugar in them. So you're actually getting a little bit of, of sugar in there. Um, but those really like anti-nausea chews is basically what they are. So you can incorporate those again, keeping them in a pocket. They're tiny. Um, I find they're really useful on the run. Uh, not uh, GI issues on the bike don't happen as much, but on the run, especially, um, and just depending on how long and how fast you're running, it's a nice, like ginger has such a sharp flavor. It's a nice break in between, um, in between some of the like super sweet stuff that you would be consuming. Um, some athletes have found that, that, that caffeine gum, uh, run gum or whatever, any of the other brands are for it. Uh, that that kind of hit of caffeine also, and again, test it out because some people don't do well with caffeine, uh, can help calm their stomach or at least if they have a headache can help with that, that headache uh, kind of sick feeling. So there's an option there. Um, in general, instead of trying to shove more products in, uh, if you, the idea of like stopping and giving your body a rest for a bit, um, letting, letting your body settle and not like it, a lot of us, if we say we have a fueling plan, I know I have to get this many gels in, I know I have, I need this much, you know, fluid and whatever it's okay. And, and Matt, uh, has said this before, same with your like pacing and power. And, uh, you know, if you need, if your plan was to run the whole marathon and you're, it's just not going your way, it's okay to like very like change from that plan and run five minutes, walk a minute. Same thing with food. It's okay to skip one or two of your feedings. Uh, if your stomach just isn't tolerating any more food, let it settle and then start back in with something very basic. Like maybe just try half of a gel just because those packets, you know, they're not, they're not single serve. They're for you to use as much or as little as you like. So maybe trying instead of having the whole gel or instead of having the whole block of chews, you have a couple or a, a smaller amount until your body can kind of get right again. Um, and it's more of a coaching thing, but you can slow your pace also. That's not food related, but slowing down to allow your body to start digesting a bit can also help. And even it's like, give yourself five, 10 minutes to win, to get back 20 minutes to a half hour later of, of feeling better. So not being afraid to like stop, reevaluate, maybe consume some of those other products. Um, and oh, I, I myself in my bottles, uh, I, I will brew a batch of like ginger tea. And then in my bottle, instead of water, I'll ice, like I'll ice it and keep it in the fridge. And then I have like ginger anti-nausea tea mixed with whatever hydration, mine's SOS. Um, and that's in one of my bottles. And that helps me, especially in that last, like that's always the last bottle I have. Um, because I know that it, A, there's a tiny bit of caffeine in there, but that it's not sweet like all of my other bottles and that ginger definitely helps calm my stomach and you can even put i put real slices of you know ginger root in my actual water bottle and then it's kind of like brewing sitting in there all day and it can really make the water um that you're drinking really helpful for for digestion and anti-nausea great well thanks for all the tips elizabeth and with that, we'll go ahead and close it out. I want to thank 
Elizabeth, for your time and everyone here for attending. Yeah, thanks. I certainly for uh, took a ton of notes. And great to see you.